Hi, and welcome to A Cup of Tea with Steve. Um, a big thank you to Pam Sharrock for my lovely mug saying A Cup of Tea with Steve. Anyway, everyone has crushes, and I don't know anybody that doesn't have a crush on my next guest. I even famously once chatted her up at a party. She's a brilliant actress, a singer, and an activist. Welcome, Heather Peace. Hey, Heather, how are you? <laughs> I'm okay. The sun is shining. I know, it's really, it's this summer starting after the weirdest weather ever. I know, I know, do you know, I've just been, a, I've just been away filming and we're meant to be like, um, shooting as though it's like spring this time last year, you know, so I had to wear all the clothes that I would have been wearing in March last year, but it was absolutely freezing. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been filming? Do you know, do you know, it's one of those really annoying things where they make you sign an NDA. Oh, you can't speak about it. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have even brought it up. I know I hate signing those things. <laughs> to tell everybody, don't you? Has so how's lockdown been for you? Um, yeah, it was an interesting one. It was an interesting one because Ellie's a teacher. So yeah. um, I essentially had to look after and teach my five-year-old while she was teaching other people's kids. And we, um, I'd say it was a mixture of mayhem and magic in the sense that some days I was just so run ragged. So I've got twins who at that point would not quite three and Annie was not quite five. So they all had lockdown birthdays. It was very sad, although we had a good day. We had good days. Um, so some days it was just carnage and um, the house just gets decimated and you're just constantly picking up and telling them off, not telling them off, but can we stop shouting? Can we stop whinging? And then other days you just got out. We, we were lucky, weren't we, with the weather? And so we'd go for our exercise, but we'd keep them out for a couple of hours. But like in the middle of nowhere, we're really lucky. We're right onto the South Downs here in Brighton. So you could literally walk out into greenery where nobody else was and just run them around for a couple of hours. Um, whereas normally we'd go to playgrounds. So I think that rediscovery of nature and finding a playground in the woods was really special. Have you been teaching, you know, you've got three daughters and you started playing piano at age six. I so, did, yeah. Yeah. Are you teaching? Are you teaching your children how to uh, uh, play piano and? Um... Well, Annie's Annie's just um, just turned six, and um, I don't want to start her too early. Um, I don't know whether you have a lot of kids in your life, Stephen, but when they're that age, they'll tell you that they can already sing, or they can <laughs> already play the piano. So she'll sit down, bash a few notes out, and I'll say, you know, would you like me? And she'll say, but, but I can already play. So. You know, so I, I sort of let them, I've got a, a music room on the top floor and it's got the laptop set up. It's got loads of stuff that make drums and all sorts of things. And so I let them loose on that and they can put their headphones on, not too loud, don't worry. Um, and they love it. And I think Annie actually, I'd love it if she was like a producer or something. She seems to really enjoy the different sounds and the different things you can do. So I, they have access to everything but I'm gonna wait until a time where she's absolutely ready to say, okay, I'm ready to sit down and concentrate. Cause I, I had periods, I, I classically learned yeah. where I hated it sometimes. I hated Mozart, sorry for anyone who likes it. But, um, it actually would put me off at times. Um, and I, I don't want that for her. So we'll see what she's into. You've said that one of your proudest things is being a mother and a wife. Uh, and I've known you for years, it's such a big difference. <laughs> I, was, I was a party girl, Stephen, there's no denying, there's no denying my party days. Yeah, we had some laughs, but um, <laughs> how, how, I mean, apart from the obvious, how has it changed you being a mum and, and a wife? I've grown up, mate, I've grown up. <laughs> I remained a child for far too long and I emotionally didn't develop. I think the thing that Ellie's given me is a, um, an emotional maturity. I was always that. I was always that one that would fall apart for no reason, really, and um, I didn't think deeply enough. I thought, well, no, that's not fair. I, I did, but perhaps I didn't know how to share that or articulate that. And now I think there's just a sense of I'm, I'm really happy, and there's a real groundedness that goes with being a mum. Yeah. There's a real responsibility in just because you feel that way tired or grumpy or whatever that doesn't mean that you have to let everybody know we're going to ask you this we're living in a very intolerant age still 
you know, uh, and you hear it from people, uh, oh, yeah, there's nothing against it, but it's the children I worry about, they might get bullied at school, and we can't brush it under the carpet and just say, well, we've got speech. What do you say to people or LGBT people who would like to have children, but then have worries that people are going to judge them? Uh, what are the negatives and the positives for you? It's tricky, isn't it? Because I'm, I'm in the very privileged situation of living in Brighton. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The thing is, like, it's it's not the cheapest place to live, and we could have possibly got a bigger house somewhere else. Um, you know, for 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 what it is here, and we did look at that. You know, with the big garden and this and that, and um, but it did come down to I did chicken out a little bit because Ellie said, "Well, maybe we should be the first gays in the village." You know, I said, "Well." I'm okay with that. Like I can absolutely take that, and I find it my mission. I'd I'd want to turn people around if they'd never met a, a lesbian couple or whatever. I I just know that we could befriend them and change their opinion. But my kids haven't asked for that, and so do you know what I mean? And like, I don't know that where they go to school, there's definitely other same-sex parents. So we're really lucky with that. Yeah. But but generally speaking, like when you you see a homophobic post on Twitter and things like that. 90% of comments call them out. Yes, it is now starting to go there. It has changed, but you, you're always going to find someone who doesn't agree. You know, we, we just a couple of years ago, we tried to get a nanny because Ellie had had an operation and I was working away and we'd got the nanny and I think it went it went mad on Twitter when I posted about it. So I was so cross and the, the, the nanny then came back, the agency and said, um, oh, sorry, but we can't because she doesn't want to work for doesn't agree with working for two months and it floored me so much for days but the positives that I took from that was it floored me so much because it just doesn't happen anymore yeah but only by, not... by only by educating uh, and talking about things like this can we go any further forward pushing it away or, or, or banning people or saying I, I think the way is people like yourself talking about it uh, yeah. People and education and, and what they don't know that they, they're frightened of sometimes. But listen, when I when I first worked with you <laughs> and tried to get you into some sexy outfits, <laughs> I had to practice. How long ago was it? it was that? When? How long ago was it, Stephen? Well, no, I can't be. But but, but, but uh, I I was seeing Demi Moore uh, and had all these outfits ready for a Demi Moore thing, and you were seeing something completely different. <laughs> and I managed to get you this amazing white sheet, uh, and 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 but but like, you had it so tight it was like like something like the Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> but anyway, the question is is. Uh, Obviously, that's changed because I've seen your pictures in Diva magazine, which are yeah. really sexy now. What what yeah. do you, in you? And, and and do you think there's too much pressure on actresses and actors to look sexy for magazine shoots? Do you know what? I, I'm trying to work out because I think this was pre lip service. And oh, only pre lip service. It was run. Yeah. I think you, I think you were in uh, oh well, London's Burning or uh, right. I'll uh, tell you exactly what it was. <laughs> Until I did lip service and I, and and the agent said you know you're gonna to have to talk about your sexuality i just wasn't comfortable enough um yes i was on television but i wouldn't do anything outside of what i had to do promotion wise for a tv show like you'd never just get me to come along and just promote myself if that makes sense yeah. and I, I didn't do that until i became vocally active for our lgbtq community yeah. um because i don't think I think there was something in, I'm trying to articulate this. I think there was something in being made to be sexy for the male gaze. <laughs> I do, I honestly do until, until people knew <laughs> who I was, it didn't feel right. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, and then as soon as like I was out, then I was like all about that. <laughs> <laughs> we had a really fun shoot. I really enjoyed it, but, but it was it's just, you, you weren't keen on the idea. Let's put it that way. But you weren't, you weren't, weren't horrible. Or anything. It was just like, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. But, um, what, what, what are you teaching? I mean, as, as I say, like, actors, I mean, every time you, you, uh, you look down at the mail, it's in a sexy outfit. Uh, there's so much pressure mm -hmm. put on people to be sexy. What, what, what are you teaching your kids about body image? Uh, oh, listen, we're all... We're all, we're all over all sorts of stuff. Our main um, 
Our main thing is about teaching the kids about consent. Now this before, because they're very young. But you know that way when you were a kid, right? And your auntie or your uncle or your mum or your dad or your, usually my brother actually, would tickle you, which makes you laugh. But then yes. they tickle you to a point that actually, although you're laughing, it hurts and feels quite suffocating. Yes. You remember those memories, yes. right? I found that actually really distressing as a kid and grown ups doing that and you feel pinned down and you feel like you're not in control. It's right from the off with our kids when we tick, my kids love being tickled, but yeah. it's absolutely on their terms. So you'll yeah. do a little tickle and they'll say stop and we stop and then they'll go tickle me again and then you'll tickle them so that all the time they feel in control. Yeah. The other thing is if they're wrestling with each other or one of the twins is trying to grab the other one and have a little fight but the other one's saying i don't like it yeah every time we just say if somebody doesn't like it we stop yeah yeah and they yeah. completely get that and i i do honestly think that we're sort of teaching them their own bodily autonomy and that they're in yeah. charge of yeah and i mean as far as body image goes um we try and monitor what they're watching i mean stuff does infiltrate always does but all they know about is being healthy. So yeah. they see they see Ellie going to yoga, they see me going out for a run. And when I hear them sort of uh, playing at families, they, um, they'll say, right, I'm going out for my exercises now. <laughs> you know, <and> they're just <laughs> pretending to be me and Ellie, you know, and I just think, okay, that's a good positive thing as well. So I, at the moment, I'm, I'm hoping it's more about health. Well, you came out when you were 19 years old. Uh, I can't yeah. say I was 16. I was 16. Um, uh, still to this day and age, sadly, you read stories of either being forced out because of the situation they're living in or chucked out uh, young gay people. What advice would you give people who, who are fright, still frightened to come out to the families? Again, it's a really, um, like the situation of me being in Brighton, it's a very, very personal situation. Only you know the views that the people around you hold. Um, but I would hope that everybody would have someone that is someone that they could go to um, in the sense that, that um, I told my brother before I told my parents, I totally misjudged my parents based on my mother's Catholicism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, she left the Catholic Church, by the I way, after well. I got married. Yeah, I'd, I'd gone, yeah, they'd, they'd lost me. <laughs> but um, my mum actually swapped, swapped to C of E not about six years ago, because yeah, yeah she's she's awesome but i think is is to ha know you've got a place to run to should it all go very very wrong i know not everybody has that option but i'd like to think that most people would have one friend or somebody that they've already told that that person knows that they're going home to tell their parents you know so that you've, you've got somewhere to go and i know that that's not always the case but there's there is help out there as well with the albert kennedy trust and um lots of you know lots of people that you could go to there's lots of things you can look up online um support and and help help networks really uh and i, I want to ask you about albert kennedy you're the patron of albert kennedy aren't you yeah they're wonderful absolutely wonderful they, they give people um they give young young people um not just they, they give them housing if they're in a desperate situation uh they that there is emergency housing that then they hopefully then move you on to that they, they look at what you want to do what are your aspirations where do you want to go to college what do you want to study if you yeah. haven't finished school they'll they'll give you a mentor that helps you finish your studies that the kids have gone on to do amazing things yeah. um so there's a mentor program there as well where some some kids go off and live with a couple who who are just there as a support network um yeah and, and they go on to training courses some have become artists one one of the lads who graduated from uh, who who used albert kennedy trust went on and had a a poetry book published you yeah. know what i mean there's there is help there and and, and also you have to remember that the school, there's help at the schools as well like when i look at you know when ellie comes home and talks to me um about what's going on at school you know there's this whole safeguarding stuff set up there as well i think you're, you're i'm a diversity role model you are as well aren't you yeah, yeah. It. it's a great thing i mean I, I i mean the first time i did it my mouth just dropped open go, going into schools and talking about it I, I kind yeah. of like a bit brought back a bit of <gasps> it's, it's fascinating we're allowed to do that 
Um, but you see that that wasn't in place when we were at school you know like if you if you, if you went into school, <laughs> yeah no if you went into school now and said that you'd come out to your parents and it had all gone very very wrong and, and whatever else you know they'd have they'd have protocols in place to make sure that you're okay you're one of the busiest actresses going <laughs> <laughs> i don't know where you've heard that I mean, well it's have tricky you seen your, have you seen your cv it's about this side. who have you enjoyed working with and what's your favorite parts been um, probably the best time I had and the most amazing people I worked with was on Waterloo Road in the sense of um, there was just a great big gang of us, uh, Laurie Brett, um, Georgie Glenn, Mel Hill, Phil Martin Brown. And we just, uh, Vix, there, was a, there was just a real crowd. We were all away from home um, and we just had the best laugh. And I'd still say that they're, Zoe Looker, I'd, I'd say that we're still Zoe. super super close you know like I, I speak to most of those people now um uh yeah so the best BBC, part... isn't it it's still you can still get it on the bbc and i think it's on netflix or <laughs> it's on yes yeah, on iplayer <laughs> it's on it's, it's, it's definitely, definitely that. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's an eye player. Now, one of the things that's been a bit been controversial over the last six months is only gay actors should play gay parts. What What do you think about that? Um, I was dead against that um, until I heard Russell T Davis speak. Yeah. After um, his recent production, um, it's a sin. Yeah. And I heard him out, and he's changed his opinion as well. Um, so I was always like, you should be able to play anything, anytime. Blah blah blah. But from my personal experience ever since doing lip service, so prior to lip service, I'd only ever played straight characters. Yeah. Um, doing lip service from there on in, everything that I get cast in is gay. Um, apart from the odd, the odd thing where some, you know, the casting director or the director literally don't know who the hell I am, <laughs> you know. So, um, so I have done a couple of things. <laughs> if, 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 if straight actors uh, then got to go play gay roles, um then the gays those of us who are gay kind of just left sitting at home because <laughs> i don't really i don't massively get considered for straight roles although oh, look i'm saying all this you're making me just think off my feet here but um no i have literally just the last role i've just played a straight anyway i think what russell t was saying there was an energy about it's a sin yes yeah. it came from the fact that that cast were gay yeah it was different it was a lived experience um, and so then, you know, the other argument is, well, why should gay people play straight roles? It's like, well, because there's about 95% more of them. And also for a lot of our life, we played straight <laughs> up until we came out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a tricky one. It's, it's a really tricky one. Um, I'm not, I thought Russell T, if anyone wants to go look for that speech that he did about that, I, I, yeah. I thought it's quite incredible. Yeah. But also, you have five albums, though. I've done a, I've done a bit of recording. Yeah. <laughs> well, I also did, I also did two covers albums over lockdown, but I didn't put them on iTunes. Because the thing is, Stephen, you can't you can't make money from records anymore. You make it from touring. Well, during yeah. lockdown, we weren't allowed to tour, so I I just put them out on my website and on um, there's another thing called Bandcamp. Yeah. So I did a couple of a couple of albums here, but then you won't find them on iTunes. <laughs> What are your music influences? It's it's a broad, broad range. Classically trained in piano. Grew up, my dad listened to Phil Collins, ELO, um, Fleetwood Mac, which I've carried on just adoring, ABBA. Yeah. Um, you know, so that was that time. Now, I, I love acoustic music. Music, I love Jose Gonzalez. Yeah. I love Eva Cassidy. Um, I love James Morrison. I love all of that. <laughs> and then I love I love electropop like Japanese House and um, Haim and uh, yeah, I've, I've sort of got, I've I've loved um, oh my god Taylor Swift. Taylor I love the I, I, I love a lot of the ones that she did during lockdown, Evermore and and stuff. So basically, I I'll have a listen to anything unless it's um, thrash metal. I'm not. I'm not a thrash metal fan. I, I, I grew up on Motown as well. Diana Ross, The Jacksons, Stevie Wonder. I love jazz. Just no thrash metal, Steve. So what else have you got coming up uh, for the rest of the year? Yeah, well, I've um, I've just finished filming this thing that I can't talk about, so that's boring. <laughs> um, I'm potentially filming again in uh, July for. I hate this year. I can't talk about it. And I'm also developing a script. 
um, for a new TV show that has had quite a bit of interest in it, uh, based in Bradford, and it's about a group of uh, very middle-aged women. Um, and it's I'm working with a with a writer. Also, I've got some online gigs in August. A couple of online gigs where I've got a live audience of thirty people <laughs> in a massive tent. Um, so it'd be the, be the first gig in front of an audience, but I'm also live streaming it. But that's all on the on the website. Heather, it's always lovely to see you as always. <laughs> yeah. And listen, Stephen, please, if you come back down to Brighton, please do get in touch. I'd love to come up and meet you at the Crescent. We'll come meet you at the Crescent. <laughs> love that. Thank you ever so much, Heather. Thank you. No worries. Bye-bye, Stephen.